would be if we see paw prints in the snow, it's probably safer to assume it was a dog than it's, it's, it's a cheetah if we're in the middle of Stockholm. You know, the prior probability of cheetah is smaller, at least I think it is. I've only been here once before. Um, this has been beautifully illustrated um, in some theoretical papers. Well, one I draw attention to is by Neil and Pouget in 2004. Um, and it has some important um, consequences, I think. One is that when we represent beliefs, they're not all or nothing. They are a probability distribution. So we don't jump to a premature conclusion. We simply send forward in our mind a probability distribution that this is the case, but it's still... Um, acknowledges that there are other possibilities. There is not, this is the case and it can't be changed. A second feature of that is that this use of probability distributions enables us to integrate information from different modalities. And I'll just take you through that. Here's the, here's the example that Nil and Pouget give. Imagine that you are looking at and hearing a buzzer, let's say, um, and your job is to find out or is to predict where the cause of that sound and that vision is. So you, you may be getting, because of noise and because of some slight misalignment, because your, your hearing is less perfect than your vision in, in locating things, you may be getting different pieces of information about where the direction of that sound or vision is coming from. So say this was um, the vision in green. This is the probability distribution centred on this point here, so it's at minus three degrees. And it has a very tight distribution because visual data is less noisy. Now let's say there's competing information from your auditory uh, senses, suggesting that actually it's probably centred on plus one degrees, but with a wider distribution. Now the question is how you can integrate those two pieces of complementary information to make a best guess of where it really is. Now the Bayesian inference allows you to, s to take more heed of the visual information because it has a, uh, a smaller noise, if you like, smaller standard deviation. So you're more likely to take more account of your visual information than you are of your auditory information, which is a very sensible thing to do. And this is uh, mathematically a fairly trivial thing to compute, your belief that it is at this particular point. Now what happens if your visual system gets noisier? Say you were looking at it out of the corner of your eye. Now here, this will take account of that because it now changes the probability distribution from the vision so that you're more likely to take more account of the auditory input. In other words, you will change your belief about where that information is coming from as a function of your prior inference or prior distribution of the probabilities and the noise. Now, I don't want to dwell on this. What I want to say is that what this tells you is that your perception is actually dependent upon a set of inferences that you've made. Your belief about where something is uh, which is expressed in terms of a perception of it being there, will change as a function of your prior experience. Perception is an inference. And this is an important insight. And it's something that um, Predrag has already shown you, a very interesting uh, illusory, um, uh, illusory demonstration of that. There are many visual illusions which are based upon this idea that what you've already inferred or believe will change what you perceive. So the most parsimonious explanation of this array is that you have a white triangle covering both this black outline and these circles. Now actually you have no strong reasons for believing that because what you've got are a series of little segmented objects and a series of lines. But it seems to be the case that your brain is more used to looking at things occluding other things and therefore you're likely to see this as a triangle. The interesting thing is, not everybody but many people actually if they defocus their eyes, can see the borders of this, even though they don't exist. So you produce the perception which fits in with your inference. Similarly, the famous Muller-Lyer illusion, because you believe that this is poking out at you and this is poking in because of the way these lines are arranged, these are uh, diverging and these are converging, um, then this line appears to be longer than this because you believe it is further away. They're actually the same length, so that, that's the basis of it. Your a priori belief from experience that this is going into the distance and this is coming out at you makes you change the way you perceive those lines. Your prior knowledge changes quite fundamentally your perception of the length. I'm not going to show this because you've already seen it. <laughs> you've already seen this, but I, I think this is a beautiful experiment. I really. Uh, Predrag was, was too um, modest 
I think this it shows that you can actually teach somebody to perceive something or teach somebody to infer something and then their perception will change. So I'm going to take you through this. This is a random dot kinematogram and it essentially consists of two sets of squares moving across each other and your perception is actually of a rotating cylinder. And interestingly, it's in inherently ambiguous, so sometimes you will see the cylinder rotating in this direction and sometimes it'll change because there's no actual sensory information to tell you which is which. So if you put someone in front of these, they will tend to flip between the two directions, left and right, of rotation. And that's natural. Sometimes they'll see it going one way, sometimes the other. Here's the clever thing. You then give them some magic glasses, or you tell them they're magic glasses, and then you actually change what they're seeing so that it truly is tending to go to the right or truly is tending to go to the left. And you make sure that they associate it with wearing those glasses. So if they wear the green on their left eye, they see the one that rotates to the right. If they wear the green on their right eye, they see the one that rotates to the left. So the people are learning that if I put these glasses on, this will change. Now the key thing is, what happens when you go back to the original truly random um, dot picture, but make them wear the glasses? Here, all that's changed is not the input sensation. It's the same as before when they were perceiving it as inherently ambiguous. What's changed is their inference based on the glasses they're wearing. And in fact, they tend to see, wearing, when they're wearing the glasses in this way, a predominance of rightward, um, rightward rotation. That shows that you can actually change somebody's prior information and therefore change their sensations. Another piece of work from this lab, again, which is from Predrag's work with, with Martin Ingvar and others, um, is, I think, really beautiful. Here, you show people nasty pictures and you ask them what they think of them. You then give them something, uh, a benzodiazepine, that makes those nasty pictures seem less nasty. You give them something else, which is a, a GABA antagonist, which is, essentially works in the opposite way to midazolam, and those nasty pictures seem even nastier. So you've taught them that the pictures can get nicer or nastier depending on what they've had. The next day you bring them in and you just give them um, placebo or control. Now the placebo, you tell them, is the same as this. And what happens to their belief about the pictures, the same types of pictures? They don't seem so worrying or so nasty anymore, even though they've just received placebo. All you've changed is just their expectation about how nasty the pictures are going to be. So this is a demonstration that even at the emotional level, the very fundamental processing of these pictures, you can change it by their prior expectation. So if perception is inference, and I think everything that we see points in that direction, what are the implications of this? Well, it seems to me that we've got a nice, robust system. There's a lot of noise out there, but if we've got prior expectations. We can make do with um, very little information, and we can draw conclusions and paint a, a beautiful picture of the world that seems to fit in with things. Uh, we perceive noisy data very well if we have prior expectations. But there's a danger, and that danger is we become inflexible. We become prejudiced about what should be there, and therefore we see that. So what is the example of the robustness and the efficiency? I'd just like to play you a, a sound here. I hope you can hear it. Now, I don't know if anyone could hear any speech in that. Many people hear it as just like a queer sort of bird song. I'm now going to present you with... The camel the was kept in a cage at the zoo. So that's clear speech. Did you all get that? So if I play you the original one again, all that I'm changing is what you have experienced, what your prior expectations were. Now, most people can now hear, hear that very clearly. And it's an interesting effect because it lasts. Um, I tried this with my children. I played them just once. Two weeks later, they could clearly interpret the second one, even though they'd not heard it, or the first one, even though they'd not heard it subsequently. There is a profound change in the way you perceive that, merely as a function of one further experience. Um, many people will have seen this before. This is, in terms of actual information, <laughs> there's very little on this, but it doesn't actually take long to see a Dalmatian dog embedded in this picture. At least I hope it doesn't. If you can't see it, that's the sort of the chin and its ears flopping down there as it sniffs along the ground. These are his back legs. Now, that's not much information to go on, and yet you have a very rich picture. And a lot of that is based upon what should be there, what you expect to be there, and therefore what you perceive. So it's good news having this system, I think, but it's also potentially bad news, the danger of inflexibility. We see what we expect to see. And this is where I think the importance of prediction error as a signal for change, a signal that our inferences are wrong, becomes important. Um, this has been beautifully